hello everyone. Welcome to Estimote's uh, webinar on the, the new Eddystone Beacon protocol, which um, has been announced just last week by Google. It's uh, Google's new open source multi-platform uh, beacon format that they um, are championing and uh, encouraging developers to, to use and um, amazing new apps to be built. Uh, there's a lot of excitement around it, and we're going to go through today a bunch about the technology. Um, it's two years since Apple introduced iBeacon, so it's really exciting to see uh, one of the world's largest mobile companies embrace beacon and sensor technology, and we're ultra excited about it. Um, so I'm Steve Cheney, Estimo co-founder, and I have Peter Kravitz alongside us, which is our one of our um, engineers that specializes in mobile SDK and is generally our one of our customer technology evangelists. So we're, um, we're basically going to go through a bunch of uh, you know of awesome stuff today. On, on the agenda, it's going to be ma mainly product um, and technical focused, and we want to kind of keep it that way. We assume that most of the people listening on this webinar are potentially marketers that are looking at the tech, but um, Estimote really strives hard to service developers and to make sure that people that are creating and building um, new you know, experiences that are contextualized in the, in the real world can um, understand kind of like what's actually happening. There's a lot of hype uh, historically around iBeacon and there's this new protocol. What is it? Um, what isn't? Uh, what, what does it not do? Uh, how have we embraced it? What do we think about the future of it? And again, we'll, we'll largely have a technical um, section here, but what we're going to also split it up is uh, we'll kind of, you know, just talk about the business ramifications that we see so far. Um, it's obviously very new and it's just been announced, but as we kind of weave through all of this, we'll also leave some time for Q&A at the end. We want to keep this fairly tight and concise and uh, hopefully the webinar in total will be 30 minutes and then maybe in 15 minutes of Q&A. So um, uh, in addition to just sort of Eddystone, Google um, has some APIs um, and they have something called the physical web. So what does all this mean? Uh, and so, yeah, the next slide is great. Um, so, so yeah, so here we just kind of talk about what is a beacon? Why is there an eye in front of it? Uh, what do mobile app developers do when they want to get a location fix? There's this thing called core location that is what very well known that's Apple's uh, ability to wake up an app. So I'm going to basically just, you know, sort of hand it over to, to Peter here, and he's going to walk through uh, some of the misconceptions that at a high level should be framed properly before we kind of dive into Eddie Stone, and, and you'll specifically see Apple's approach with iBeacon and Eddie Stone's approach, uh, uh, which again, you know, it's not Google Beacon, it's called Eddie Stone, and I think the, the concept from Google is to push the market forward and have some things that are open, but you'll also notice that um, there's some things that are closed that you can't get access to. So with that, I'll hand it over to, to Peter. Yeah, hey guys, excited to be here. So um, we actually wanted to start with like this simple diagram to, uh, and, and it's actually mostly about iBeacon, and we're here to talk about Eddie Stone, and, and, and this is mostly to address like some um, sort, sort of early stage misconceptions uh, which were naturally arising around um, Eddie Stone. So um, what does it actually mean, a beacon, an ID beacon, or, or, you know, like an SDK uh, to, um, to detect that all, right? Like, so far it's been easy. I, we've had a beacon, an ID beacon, and like, many people actually sort of like associate one with another, but that's actually not true. So like to the left here, for, uh, we, have, uh, we have the beacon hardware, so, like the, the, the beacon, the hardware itself, right? So, um, and, uh, and in the middle, we have, we have the protocol, which, which like the hardware speaks. And, and, and I'm saying speaks because like that's actually my favorite analogy here. Um, that of a like natural language. So uh, we all have like the same sort of mechanisms to, to speak, right? All, like vocal cords and mouths and tongue. And, um, but yeah, like the, the language that like comes out of our mouth can actually be, dif be different, right? So, um, so, so, so it's like important to have this, uh, this separation here between like the beacon, the hardware, which is just like broadcasting some, some Bluetooth radio waves and the language it speaks, right? Which like so far has mostly been focused uh, around ID, and, uh, which is like UID major and minor. And then to the far right side, we have, um, we have something to actually detect, uh, detect the beacons, right? So like the SDKs, the APIs, which, uh, which allow the magic to happen, uh, like the, to, to, um, to actually tap into the power of beacon uh, in our own apps. And um, on Android, uh, this is the Bluetooth LE um, API and iOS ordinarily this is the core Bluetooth API, uh, which is used to detect Bluetooth uh, Bluetooth devices, um, which speak like different Bluetooth protocols. But um, so actually, iBeacon is a bit special uh, in that regard, as in um, Apple's like tight integration of hardware and software led them to like the decision that they will actually integrate Beacon in, uh, as a part of like the core location API. And um, why is that important? We'll like come back to this later. But yeah, like essentially, like there is something special about iBeacon on the iOS platform, uh, which like 
it, it, it's something good to uh, to keep in mind when uh, when we'll be moving forward. So um, there's one thing missing uh, from this picture, uh, which I actually think is like pretty important to keep in mind as well. Uh, it's like the ST mode SDK, or actually how I prefer to call them, like the, the split between sort of like low level APIs and SDKs and, 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 and higher level SDK or an API. So like core location or Android Blue DLE is like a low level API, which enables you to uh, your, your apps to communicate with, with BLE devices. But pretty often we have like some more high level, like more complex uh, SDKs building on top of that to provide some some extra features, right? Like in case of, in, in case of an ST mode SDK, we can use like core location to detect beacons, but we may also send like some analytics tied to that beacon to the ST mode cloud, right? So we provide some functionality on top of core location. And so Peter, for developers or people that are maybe new to beacons generally or have built some app but haven't gone full scale, a lot of these services that we provide and we build um, that are that are pure software on top of iBeacon. Um, we're going to describe why those might be relevant and, and, and needed no matter what the underlying packet format is, right? So the what, what we like to call increasingly these like enterprise grade uh, features to remotely manage 100,000 beacons across 2,000 stores or to get analytics uh, automatically or to smooth the, um, some of the signals from multiple beacons and get a better fix indoors, right? These are the services that you're talking about that can generally leverage um, something that is, goes way beyond what Apple provides at a base or now also what Eddie Stone provides as a base protocol, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and the, the main reason I'm actually bringing this up is um, we'll be moving forward. We'll be also like discussing uh, the nearby API, which is like essentially a high level SDK uh, from Google building like on top of those low level core Bluetooth, uh, Android Bluebelly. Um, APIs. It's like important to know that like um, the higher uh, level API or SDK is actually like dependent on the low level, right? So like yeah. if there is something Core Bluetooth doesn't allow you to do, there is like no way Google with their nearby API or Estimode or any other vendor uh, will actually be uh, be able to do. So so this is like the special. This, this is the, the special thing about IDGAT, right? It's Core Location yes. versus Eddystone, which is which is Core Bluetooth. And if you flip that and just think about the consumer value of any app that can use contextualized, you know, whether it's a beacon or iBeacon, doesn't matter, um, what is the value in using another SDK? The, the developer is always going to be critical of that. They're not just going to want to adopt another SDK or framework that is unnecessary. They're only going to do that if it makes their life easier and, and, and solves a challenge, right? So, so we, um, with that, I'll stop. But um, I think that's how we're going to frame some of the software layers that are emerging, services that are emerging, and also some of the things that Google has announced alongside their own packet format. Yeah, exactly. There's there's definitely a lot of potential here, and um, so yeah, let's actually move to Eddystone. Um, so so we see like a very similar diagram. We have the very same hardware to the left, right? Like every single estimate beacon ever shipped, you can update it to firmware uh, 3.1.1 uh, and set it to like speak Eddystone to broadcast Eddystone, and and you don't need like any hardware changes, right? So like the only thing that actually changes with Eddystone uh, is uh, is this language, is the protocol. Uh, it's like something important to internalize. Uh, well, on iOS, like there is actually this subtle distinction, but but pretty important that uh, we're actually dealing with core Bluetooth here and no core location, um, which has yeah yeah certain, like, like basically leads to a certain differences. When it comes to the Android, it's exactly the same. We're dealing with the exact same uh, Bluetooth Low Energy API. So uh, so everything we can do with like um, it's unofficial iBeacon support on Android, uh, we can we can do with an Edistone. So, uh, so that's quite important. So, yeah, uh, let's actually talk about this middle part. So, like Edison versus iBeacon, right? We already know it's like the the protocol, like like the language uh, beacon speak. But how did it actually differ? So, like the first difference, it's an open protocol, uh, Edison. Everyone can like go to GitHub and download a spec, whereas iBeacon Apple actually keeps the iBeacon spec behind closed doors. So, um, like this is an interesting part, uh, but. Essentially, you can think about it as sort of like read-only access, right? To uh, to Eddystone, you can go ahead and download the spec. What personally interests me uh, more is how open Google will be to sort of like read-write, uh, like how open will Google be to like community contributions and suggestions when it comes to like the future of Eddystone, right? Uh, we've seen a bunch of uh, pull requests and and, and discussions uh, around Eddystone going on um, on Google's GitHub so far, and some of those pull requests accepted. So far, mostly minor contributions to like the documentation or fixes in the uh, examples and tools. I'm, 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 I'm actually wondering how open Google will be to uh, more sort of like 
substantial uh, developments of, of the Ediston protocol. In fact, this remains an open question. Definitely, and keep in mind um, around the fact that this is an open protocol, you'll see that there's there's definitely things closed around the use of the protocol at the higher le levels. And one of the services that Google's promised is the nearby API. Um, and this is this is actually, as we'll talk about and in in, uh, we'll get to later, is not uh, is not open. Yeah, yeah, precisely. So yeah, um, we have the second sort of like differentiator, Eddystone versus iBeacon. Uh, so like at Eddystone from day one, um, the design goal is actually to support both iOS and Android platforms. And this is not to say that other platforms want to be supported as well, right? Like uh, iBeacon doesn't have an official support on Android as well, but there are some like unofficial, unofficial libraries that allow you to detect them and uh, probably we'll see the same for Eddystone, right? Just just because it's not a design goal, it's an open protocol. So every, everyone, everyone can download the spec and just make, make their own uh, um, SDK for Windows, Macs, and whatever other platforms of uh, of choice. Uh, the reason why I'm mentioning it, it's it's it was actually important because uh, like ordinarily this is something that the API, uh, the platforms API actually uh, either allows you to do or not, right? Um, but um, so like the protocol itself doesn't actually impact. Uh, shouldn't actually impact the fact whether it's supported by some platform or not, or not right? That the platform either allows you to scan for BLE devices or not. Um, but um, on iOS, there are like certain important things to keep in mind. Like, for example, if you want to support scanning for BLE devices in the background, you need to include the service UID, which we'll talk about later. And um, it, it was actually uh, great to see that uh, the folk working at Eddystone had this like in mind from, from day one and actually designed the protocol around like interoperability interoperability with uh, with iOS uh, of course it's like you can only go so far because there are some core Bluetooth limitations but um yeah that's um, uh, quite important not to like hinder your protocol uh, from day one but uh, but by by but but design and uh, this is something that's not the case with uh, with Eddie stone and um, first probably more most prominent difference uh, like I, I actually called it like Edison's more expressive. It gives you like three types of frames to choose from, as opposed to a beacons just like UID major and minor. Um, depending on your use case, right? So we have Eddystone UID, which is like most similar to iBeacon, just, just like an opaque ID that your app needs to interpret and like take certain action on it. We have the Eddystone URL, so like the promise of the physical web, something we'll, I'm pretty sure we'll like discuss in greater detail later on, uh, with like the URL encoded into the packet. And uh, finally, also an interesting development, we have the uh, telemetry packets. So, uh, so, so like a packet which is like mostly focused around beacon health status as opposed to like identifier or like some, some data. Uh, I, I like to like make this, this distinction like data packet versus sort of like maintenance packet, which is uh, which is the telemetry packet. Um, so so we have those three and um, so so this is like something important to note here is like uh, Eddystone specification doesn't really tell you whether like th those are exclusive, like you need to use one or the other or something like that. Like the, the, only, the, the only thing they say is like the telemetry packet because it's like a maintenance packet um, is, is actually designed to be interleaved with one uh, of the other um, data packets. So you can like broadcast the UID packet then the uh, TLM packet, then UID packet again, then TLM packet again, and so on and so forth. And it doesn't need to be one-to-one -one ratio, right? You can only broadcast your TLM packet once an hour, once a minute, once a day. Uh, that's your like, uh, basically vendor's design decision. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so, high, so high level when we think about just generally how beacons have evolved to become like an extremely useful way of placing a uh, a long-lasting, cheap device in a physical environment or to an object, and they broadcast location and information. So, so of course, the, a beacon can broadcast any information. And so, Eddie Stone has has decided. Um, you know, the, the the group behind this at Google has decided that that it, it's better that to just uh, give more flexibility to a developer and have some definition of other packet types they may become useful in the future, right? And so this URL concept, as we talk about it in a little bit, of the physical web is, is totally new and new and unproven, but maybe your web browser um, gets rid of the app limitation so you don't have to download an app for the museum when you go there, the, the browser um, automatically understands that uh, a beacon is broadcasting a URL and it, it naturally like identifies with that, right? And so this tele telemetry thing, again, we're going through the, the next slide, kind of the technology behind it, but at a high level, what does it mean to broadcast this other packet that has something like the health of the beacon. Well, it just could be something simple where you need to know as an owner of the venue if your beacon has died or if it's been moved, right? So this definition, um, Google has decided that it makes sense to sort of define these more 
um, specifically as opposed to letting the developer use like metadata in some packet to just kind of do this uh, on their own, right? And so that's, this is, the, this is, these are again core differences. The Eddystone UID is something most similar to iBeacon. The URL is a totally new concept. And the telemetry, so the, using data in the packet to broadcast something about the beacon itself is something that isn't done in iBeacon. Now, we'll, I'll stop there, but does that mean that the Eddystone is better than iBeacon? And clearly the answer to that is no. It doesn't mean that it's better. It just means that it has, um, it's been defined to, to, to have different potentials. Yeah, it doesn't mean it's better. It's, it's just different, right? Uh, it's like to be a, yeah, like a, a little bit of cliche, but uh, that, that's how I would uh, actually characterize it. So yeah, that's like the high level overview, but um, um, Eddystone being an open format, uh, we thought it would be actually interesting to dive in and, and, and see what's in there, right? So uh, here we have how, uh, here it is, how, how every single Eddystone, like regardless of the actual sort of like subtype, this is how every Eddystone packet uh, starts, right? We have like those three sort of chunks of uh, advertising data, the first one, Pretty much like non-interesting, some flags, some generic flags. Um, then, uh, then we have like th this first sign of like the design decision to support uh, iOS and Core Bluetooth and be able to uh, detect uh, Eddie Stones even when the app is not running. So we already know that. Um, uh, I, I've, I've mentioned this before that uh, Core Bluetooth uh, requires you to provide a service UID when you want to scan for BLD devices in the background. What's a service UID? Service UID is like. Um, think a BLE device basically identifying itself to you as a heart monitor, right? Or like an Edison, um, a beacon. Uh, or, or a Bluetooth headset. So, so uh, like I, uh, Apple basically made this decision that if you want the privilege of being able to scan for BLE devices uh, when your app is not running, out of like the uh, respect for uh, like the um, user smartphone, like the battery consumption and, and, and all those things, you should be able to like narrow down the list of devices you're interested in to some like very specific types. So, so they actually re require you to provide a service UAE. And here is like the first, uh, the first example of like. Uh, this this like design goal to support iOS. Uh, Edison actually actually includes the service UID. So uh, they 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 were assigned this uh, like unique value FEAA, which you see here, and uh, which you can use to actually scan for uh, specifically Edison VLE devices, uh, even when in the background. And the first chunk is actually the day the data itself. It's the data for this specific service, right? So like. Uh, here I am, an Edison beacon, and here is like the data I carry. And and this 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 part is actually what well, the, the part that will differ between uh, the subtypes. So um, we have we, we have those three types. We've already talked about it, and so uh, we have this eleventh byte uh, here, which you can see, which is actually how um, the SDKs and, and like APIs are supposed to uh, differentiate between uh, between those types, uh, those packet types, uh, so like. Every single one has assigned like a different value. So here is a UID frame, for example, right? That so starts with like the frame type, which is a zero um, value, and then um, the the first part, the ca calibrated transmit power at zero meters. So basically, like at the beacon, like what's the beacon's uh, broadcasting power? This is used to like uh, provide a like computed um, an estimate of the distance uh, on the device, right? If I receive the signal from the beacon on my smartphone with a certain strength, and I know that the like the at the beacon itself the signal is this strong, right? Because I received this data in the packet. Then uh, I can actually apply some mathematic model and and estimate like guess uh, how far from the beacon I am. So uh, so es essentially uh, providing something like ranging uh, in in case of an eye beacon, right? An important thing to note here is like uh, in and on itself, like the protocol can't like. If, there are those questions already circulating the internet and people asking us like, will distance estimations be more accurate on Eddystone than on iBeacon? It's like, this doesn't actually depend on the protocol, right? It depends on like the hardware part, so like the very, like the, the far left part, uh, like the antenna uh, quality, uh, or the very right part, right? Like when we actually receive the data, we can apply like to this mathematical model to some smoothing out, um, eliminate the noise and yeah, like here is actually like um, where, where where we can make it m less or more uh, accurate. Like the the protocol itself, um, not much uh, not much room for improvement here. Uh, and then we have uh, we have the identifier itself. Like in case of iBeacon, that's UID major and minor. A UID sixteen bytes uh, major minor, both um, two bytes each. Uh, in case of Eddystone, we have just like uh, the identifier split into two values: one the namespace, uh, ten bytes and a six byte identifier which is the instance and um the namespace uh something like like there's this unspoken sort of like good practice in the ibeacon world that's 
you just generate yourself a random unique UID and use it throughout your like entire organization or an app or something like that, right? So so Google like explicitly said we want like namespace to be used for that and like um, they, um, the Edison specification even suggests to use your uh, domain name like guestimo.com, hash it and then use like the first 10 bytes of this hash to uh, for your namespace. And then the instance, the six byte identifier which we use like to differentiate between individual beacons themselves. So again like speaking of good IB practice practices, that's what we've been using uh, major and minors uh, for so far. So like um, the only like sort of difference here is like we have a little bit more room, right? Six bytes versus like twice two bytes or so four bytes in total. But um, I wouldn't actually call it a downside. We actually have to arrange this like six byte identifier yourself, uh, ourselves, right? Like major, minor. Um, we know this is like an unsigned integer, a number from one to sixty-five uh, thousand, and and uh, we have like this hierarchy, major and minor. Uh, here we actually have to like we can split it into like two three byte values and, and use it uh, in a similar way. Um, we can use it like as a six byte like very large integer, uh, or, or we can like split it into three parts or four parts. Like the only thing we are sort of like limited by here is like the the the, the size of the uh, identifier, like the six bytes. And, and Peter, just and just to help people understand, um, and obviously when iBeacon was um, designed by Apple, they went through similar design decisions around the amount of space um, that is inside these packet, you know, these Bluetooth packets um, that, that go across the wire, right? So it sounds like uh, Apple would have had a sixteen byte um, primary identifier, and then followed by two for the thing they call the major and two for the minor, right? Yeah. So sixteen plus two plus two would be twenty bytes. On the Eddystone UID frame, there's a 10 byte for the larger names, which is less than 16, so there's fewer overall combinations of that. And then there's six bytes, but the 10 plus six is only 16. So what there's some other there's some other bytes that are reserved for like for future use, which what means that Google may add something that's more complex in there, use that byte to like handle something that they haven't defined yet. Um, so d d that's that's one thing. Like the other thing is that um, Edison and iBeacon packets are actually um, are, are actually uh, designed a little differently. So there are like some some differences in the actual design of the packets that may, that that make uh, um, that made it easy for Apple to like uh, squeeze a larger uh, larger larger identifier in there uh, compared mm -hmm. to Edison. Got it. So um, so yeah, like this is again like the trade-off between uh, being able to integrate iBeacon into core location into like iOS something like Apple, Apple obviously owns that right, so they have like much more room uh, for um, for design decisions like that. Uh, uh, Google when designing Edison had to actually operate within like certain limitations of core Bluetooth, so they ended up with like a tiny bit, a little bit like smaller identifier. Not that it actually has like any <laughs> practical meaning because like the number of possible combinations is still so vast that uh, we don't yeah. know uh, running out of like space for uh, for beacon identifiers anytime soon. Sure. This is a part for just anyone listening that is building apps or has like um, you know conceptualized the, the challenge around what does it mean to wake up the app or like you know how many regions can I have all these different things that happen that are very very different experiences on iOS than have historically been on Android just with regular location technology so a point to dig into or maybe for Q&A if you um, by the way can be submitting questions now on Twitter and other places and we'll um, we'll be able to go through those but effectively one way to, to understand you know, when um, Peter's using the term core Bluetooth that's an Apple protocol the two Bluetooth mechanisms that Apple has used um, have been core Bluetooth, but uh, also core location, which is not Bluetooth specific, but is used in iBeacon. And um, these are finer nuance points, but because again, Apple has the control and ability to just say, this is how the developer community should build apps. They are able to do things from a um, trade off of things like battery life and power and optimize in different ways that Google has had to be accommodative if they wanted to support iOS. And so one of the things that um, we'll talk about a little bit later is a challenge is that Google has to use the Bluetooth algorithm, but they don't have native access to what's called core location. And the reason is because um, Apple has that, um, that specifies how that should be used and they don't allow it to be used in a way that um, could potentially have like, uh, you know, less deterministic effects for like a mobile app uh, users and consumers, i.e. they don't want your, your battery to die. So um, I'll turn it back to you, Peter. 
Yeah, uh, so um, that's the UID uh, frame. And uh, let's move on to the URL frame. Actually, something very similar. We start with the frame tag, which is obviously a little different, uh, different value. Then we, again, have the calibrated uh, transmit power to allow uh, those distance estimations. And then the rest of the frame is actually the URL itself. But uh, there are actually a few interesting things going on here. So. Um, um, we only have 18 bytes left after the calibrated TX power. Uh, so that's like very little uh, space for, for a URL that's essentially like up to 18 characters, right? And uh, if you include that HTTP um, colon slash slash dot 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 dot, um, this already eats up like several, several, several of those bytes. So, uh, so the specification actually um, um, has something called the prefix, uh, basically like a single byte value which you can use to like define whether this is like HTTP or HTTPS, whether there is a dub 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 prefix or not. So uh, yeah, essentially like a clever sort of like space saver. And then we have up to 17 bytes of, the, of, of like the remaining part of the URL. Uh, and there is also like an interesting mechanic going on in here. Um, Addison specification basically says that you can only use US ASCII cars for, um, for your um, encoded URL. Uh, those are like the values uh, 33 to uh, 126. Um, so we end up with like a bunch of, uh, a bunch of bytes. Uh, Essentially unused. Uh, so, 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 yeah. Like uh, in case of Eddystone, those are those are actually, um, yeah. Google decided to use them for um, so-called text expansions, right? So, if we take a value of a byte zero, for example, that essentially expands to dot com slash. Uh, if the if the value of the byte is seven, um, then that expands to dot com. So, so um, an example here, if we take the HTTP dot com slash indoor, that's essentially thirty characters, so like uh, way above the limit. Um, uh, we would like ordinarily be subject to, but uh, then we actually encode the HTTP dub 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 within the prefix. Uh, we use eight bytes for ST mode. We uh, use a single byte to expand our dot com or like make it into like a, a, a single byte, and then we have like uh, the um, dot com slash actually, uh, and then we have six bytes remaining for indoor, right? So we, we managed to encode a 30 character long URL. On 16 bytes, uh, so so like one byte short, short of the limit, and and this actually includes prefix. So uh, could think about it as like two two bytes uh, short, short of the limit. So this is still not entirely like uh, like not a lot of space to put your URLs in there. So uh, yeah, we'll definitely see some some link shorteners going on in there. But um, that's just like gives you an idea that. Um, Google actually has put some thought into uh, into design of of, of the Edison uh, protocol, and that's 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 great to see. Yeah, they put a lot of thought in. I think um, the, the the main summary of the slide again is that um, there's a ha effectively there's a bunch of different compression schemes and um, defining some different things that a developer would need to use to to get their URL encoded. So it's not ideal, and if you're using a link shortener, that doesn't. It doesn't. It's not an obvious what when you you know uh, click a link to a link shortener. So if the beacon is broadcasting, you know it's used in Disney movie theaters, and you approach um, the theater and the URL is being broadcast. It would be better if you could understand what that URL was when you saw it um, on the browser, as opposed to it had to be decoded. But these are just finer things. Um, the the takeaway is that Google's pretty serious about this physical web stuff, and um, you know have, have really just elegantly as elegantly as possible brought it into the URL frame of Eddie Stone. So it's it's going to be interesting to see what people do with this. Yeah, definitely Eddie Stone URL probably something I'm the most excited about when it comes to Eddie Stone. But um, yeah, we'll we'll cover that uh, a little bit more. Uh, in a little bit more detail later, the concept of physical web. Um, so yeah, just like finally, let's let's quickly jump to the uh, telemetry frame, see what's actually in there, what's what what this uh, beacon health uh, status constitutes of. Um, so uh, we have the frame type, we have the TLM version, which already like tells us that uh, we can expect some updates to uh, to this TLM frame uh, in the future. Maybe like include include data from some additional sensors. Uh, some beacons actually have accelerometers in their estimates. Does so yeah, maybe we can actually uh, include something accelerometer related in there. So so there is uh, definitely like some some planning for the future here um, um, uh, in in the design of Edison. And then we have battery voltage, which we can use to. Uh, 
uh, estimate the um, remaining battery level of, uh, of a beacon, obviously, and, and a beacon temperature, which could be useful when deploying in some harsh uh, locations just to keep track of uh, the temperatures our, our beacon is are, um, exposed to. And finally, like some 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 maintenance data, number of packets sent since last reset, and and, and beacon beacons uptime. By the way, and just like a side a side experiment at the very bottom of the slide here is like no, those values will will not overflow for like another thirteen years, uh, even if we advertise one packet every uh, one hundred milliseconds. So uh, so so we're actually safe here. So um. This is this is actually it about Eddystone, and 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 I'm like not joking. Like this is literally it about Eddystone because uh, one thing to keep in mind is like Eddystone is just a protocol. It's it's like it's a to, it's a specification. You can go to GitHub and download it and build your own beacon, which broadcasts Eddystone packets, and you can build your own SDK that uh, that listens for 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 like Eddystone BLE devices. But like Eddystone is just this thing in the middle, right? Um, but um, so, so like your next step would be to actually go and like uh, um, utilize your core Bluetooth or Android Bluetooth uh, API uh, knowledge to build yourself like a library that will detect beacons, uh, like uh, Eddystone beacons. But yeah, fortunately you don't have to uh, um, estimate. And uh, we had like support for Eddystone for day one in in our SDKs, and like even Google when they released their um, example apps uh, on like day one Eddystone. Um, uh, it, it, they essentially build themselves like a mini SDK, which is like available on GitHub, and you can you can download it and see how to like detect Eddystone uh, beacons um, using Core Bluetooth and, and and Android APIs, right? But um, so 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 this is Eddystone, but Google actually announced uh, a few more really exciting things, and we'll cover those now. And 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 those are the proximity API and nearby API. Um, and, and, and the concept of physical web and, and something that excites me the most uh, is like Google also said that they'll start like uh, implementing beacons in their own services as, as, as well. So uh, so yeah, like similar to uh, what we've done with like the, the Eddystone specification, like a little dive in to see what's in there. Uh, we'll we'll, we'll uh, do like this little dive in right now. Uh, so starting with like the proximity API, this is essentially Google's uh, like beacon fleet management and, and, and key value store. Like I, I like to call it a mini CMS. Um, API and this is like a web API, so, so, so something you hit through a uh, sort of like a RESTful API, um, and and right off the bat, I find I, I find it uh, very interesting because like the the especially the fleet management part of like the proximity API and the telemetry packet um, basically means like Google acknowledges all the challenges. Uh, uh, that, that are there when, when deploying beacons, right? You need to like keep track of, of those devices, like hundreds, maybe thousands spread uh, spread apart in like multiple geolocations. And you actually need to assign some content to them because like in and on themselves, like those are the identifiers don't really tell you much. So so Google is like, yes, we're ready like from the day one. And I, I actually find it interesting. Like many people uh, they usually ask us like, why estimate cloud, right? I just I, like need a beacon. It's like, Many people just don't realize that there's like a lot of those uh, additional challenges when it comes to beacon deployments, and it's nice to see that Google actually actually sees that, and and, and they are ready like with their own solution to like uh, help developers. For sure, I think I think Google's um, historical strength around cloud-based web services is um, is showing that the way that they've thought about beacons, and of course, the market has really understood now that having a dumb commodity piece of hardware um, is either not interchangeable, and moreover, um, the beacon itself is just a way to distribute some intelligence between a client you know, running a specific app and, and the cloud. And without services to manage tens of thousands of beacons at scale, it's a non-starter, right? So if you're a, a large retailer <clears throat> um, and you're, you're not gonna be putting uh, devices throughout your stores and have those calibrated and have those sent to store managers to be placed somewhere unless there's there's tied very deeply to web services, right? And what, what do those services need to be? There's some of the stuff that um, Google has a hunch around like, well, life of the beacon, which is again called telemetry, but it's just their term in the Eddystone packet format to store some data about what's going on in the device. Um, this is an area that Estimo invests heavily in. Um, I think what we'll see with Eddystone is similar to what we've seen with iBeacon, that enterprise class deployments just absolutely need um, much, much more services on top of 
just the beacon hardware itself than what is provided at the base level with iBeacon. We're gonna see the same thing with Eddie Stone, that there may be some things that Google um, tries to help with with the nearby API, and they're gonna talk more about that um, and how beacons potentially could be like crowdsourced so that the location of a, a device would be, become known if users um, interact with that device. These all use web services, so, so Estimote has a really rich offering in the cloud and how we think about these at scale deployments that are enterprise grade, and um, you feel free to ask questions more about that uh, to us and that we can address um, at the end of the presentation. Yeah, and uh, actually one, one, in, one more interesting tidbit about uh, the proximity API, it, it's, it's actually designed for uh, Eddystone, but also iBeacon and AltBeacon. So you can also store information about your iBeacon and AltBeacon uh, sort of like fleet uh, in uh, the Google Cloud and also like uh, utilize the key value store uh, with those, which I also think is, is, is like an interesting move. Uh, what do you think about that, Steve? Yeah, yeah. I think the, um, the the it's it's a str it's a strong way to put some sense in order around the fact that a beacons like two two beacons in your lab as a mobile app developer is very different than having a beacon in every SMB and, and having it um, you know work with multiple apps or, or just in general like be a service that could be available more broadly to the to to a community of developers and it it, it just really is. It's, it's representative of um, the, the gaps that exist and have existed today and like getting these things to work when you are talking about lot much larger scales. And so uh, I think I think we're um, we're excited about the angle that that proximity and the APIs that that that, that they're talking about with nearby. Um, we're really excited about seeing kind of like developers, um, you know, just just really increase their expectations of how they can uh, build stuff. And then again, the, some of this is gonna be uh, announcing Google Play services and, and it's not necessarily gonna be open source. So there there are some some stuff in ways here that Google is keeping like a really tight um, view of how it should be used, right? True, true, yeah. And um, But still, I, I think it's nice to know that uh, Google actually offers you this flexibility to like uh, sort of choose uh, between the protocols or like uh, just use you know like one 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 single service for all so um let's actually go ahead and like take a quick look at uh, what constitutes the proximity API so here's like the most important resource uh, you can store in the Google Cloud um, the, the, the beacon resource right so uh, we have the beacon name which is like uh, automatically uh, assigned uh, when you create a beacon uh, in the cloud we have the advertised ID uh, which, yeah, like you can actually see here that you can choose from the type. Edistone is one, iBeacon is uh, another valid option, and, and, and then we also have AltBeacon, and a base 64 encoded um, identifier of the beacon tag. So, like UID major minor or namespace in type. Uh, we have the status uh, active, which like me means uh, basically the beacon is up there and um, should be detectable by uh, mobile devices. We have inactive which is the beacon is like up there, but uh, shouldn't be detectable by like the mobile SDKs. Uh, so like essentially a virtual on, on and off switch and decommission, which is like the beacon is like no longer in use. And um, following up, place ID, latitude, longitude, uh, indoor level, those are all, all like tied to a Google Places API. Uh, and also like for me, this is obviously uh, in and on itself uh, useful, uh, just like that, right? You know where the beacon is, uh, which floor it's at, and 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 which like place it's associated with. But it's also like a sign of Google like already integrates beacon into their uh, other services. In this case, the the places API. We have the expected stability, uh, which is actually interesting, and um, I'll I'll come back to this later. It's like stable, unstable, portable, uh, mobile. Uh, or roving depending on like how much the beacon actually moves, right? Just a little, it's like unlikely it'll move or like it moves sometimes or it moves all the time. Um, description, uh, some 140 characters to put some 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 uh, some things of, uh, you want uh, in there. And properties, so like um, say uh, beacon vendors can probably like upload the beacon firmware in there or like uh, some additional data. But uh, yeah, like this is essentially something you need to like um, keep updated manually, right? So like, uh, maybe a little less convenient than Estimate Cloud, for example, where like uh, every time you make a change to your beacon settings, you automatically upload it uh, to the Estimate Cloud and, and like download the, the fresh version. Uh, so then we have like the CMS ish part uh, of of the proximity API. Um, Google calls it attachments, basically something CMS you can CMS meaning a content management system, right? For people that, um, that yes, yes, precisely. Uh, Sorry. Um, no, so no worries. Be beacons are pretty useless unless they um, are tied. To contextualized experiences for the user. So often you'll hear of just the content management system or the CMS as like being a, a critical part of any 
any deployment. And, and again, um, that's that's stuff that's typically managed in the cloud, right? So the CMS um, would be like if, again, by the example of Disney, you walk into a theater and then the app understands your specific area and shows you specific content. Well, that could all be managed in some content management system that a marketer would use in uh, Disney headquarter, right, in the cloud. Yeah, 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 precisely. So again, like pretty nice uh, that Google actually like embraces it from day one. They uh, they sort of like acknowledge that uh, this is this is how beacons work. Like you need a place to actually store some external information, and and they actually give it to developers from day one. Um, Something of note here is uh, I, I haven't found a way to actually assign an attachment to more than one beacon, which might be a little inconvenient. I'm not sure if Google like the, the API is still in like beta, uh, I believe. So uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll we'll see if like any of, of of this changes. And like the length of the data you can actually store is also limited to one kilobyte. So uh, so probably enough to store like a huge uh, chunk of text. Maybe not like huge, but like, fairly large chunk of text. Uh, but probably not enough to store like photos or entire video. So you would still need to upload them somewhere, Google Drive or something, and um, and, and and hold the reference here. So maybe like less uh, less convenient than, than the existing Beacon CMSs. And finally, we have the um, like the fleet management uh part of the proximity API. Um, so far, we just have like the estimated low battery date uh, here. So yeah, like just an estimate, and and a bunch of alerts. Like at this time, Google only defines two wrong location, which is, like to detect when the beacon moved, uh, and and this is what the uh, like the, the um, like this this like portable or, or or stable or unstable status is uh, I believe used for, and like a low low, low battery alert and alert unspecified should never appear. I. I I love uh, I, I love those kinds of comments because yeah I'm pretty sure it'll pop up somewhere at some point. Um, but anyway, so 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 like sort of like summing up, uh, this this is this is like um, a joint sort of like proposal to to hold your like beacon content and 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 some like fleet management solution and I'm I'm, I'm it's like I think it would be interesting to like uh, try and compare it with like existing solutions, right? We have like a lot of beacon CMS software already out there uh, where we can like upload photos and uh, maybe like assign attachments to more than one beacon. So uh, yeah, it's like great that Google actually embraces it from day one. They actually provide you like a mini CMS system. But um, yeah, how this will actually fare uh, when compared like against uh, existing existing software. And same for, for fleet management, right? Like. Um, this like uh, beacon vendors will probably um, have uh, like the most power uh, usually here uh, because they can like tightly integrate hardware and software and like keep beacon settings in sync and, uh, and maybe allow things like uh, estimates uh, estimate clouds uh, remote management capability so that's something Google obviously won't be able to do but like paired with the nearby API uh, and and this is something like re remains to be seen like uh, if uh, is everyone um, with an Android phone, with Google Play services installed and running, going to actually end up being a proxy, like uh, receiving the telemetry packets and uploading them like anonymously um, to 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 the proximity API, which will enable Google to like actually predict those those like low battery levels and maybe like unusually low detection rates. This, this is something that actually taken off the documentation of the proximity API. So yeah, like a, a lot of like open questions here, but. Uh, Probably the power of proximity API will come from its like integration with the nearby API. Yeah, I think um, so. So these so these two APIs that we're talking about a lot, you'll notice that um, during the Eddie <laughs> Stone section, it's completely over. Um, but the nearby API and the proximity API is like, well, why did you know Google spend so much time thinking about how this might work, and what are some of the challenges around uh, the putting beacon hardware in the wild, placing it. And of course, it's not um, obtaining a beacon or getting it to uh, to run you know, this base protocol. It's getting them to be adaptable and resilient. And potentially, like you need to update it later, or you need to understand, hey, like I've put this in my, my physical space in my store. I can't tell the store manager to go find them all and replace them if the battery dies or if one's missing. And so it's super exciting to see these proximity APIs. But I think the market will uh, have to decide whether it embraces this. And um, there's a limited amount of intelligence that, that, that Google is saying that should be that they've specified as um, their framework to think through. I, I would just say that like, you know, as a company that specializes in this tech, we see hundreds of companies building content management systems. And <clears throat> these are these are also retailers, 
and folks that build their own or um, maybe solutions that uh, somebody could purchase off the shelf and integrate with like Estimote's um, APIs and just kind of get running as like a complete solution. The, 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 the takeaway here, if you're thinking about like a deployment at scale or you're thinking about the, does Eddie Stone provide some of that magic silver bullet now that's like so much better than what IB can provide it? And like, again, the answer is no, um, but it, we'll see um, how the community embraces some of this. It is obviously promising that, that, they, that they have thought about um, what scale might mean to deployments. Yeah, definitely. So um, we've talked a lot about nearby API so far, but haven't really explained uh, what it is. So like, here is actually my my quick pitch when it comes to like the nearby APIs, like the proximity SDK for uh, iOS and Android from 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 Google, right? So essentially, like this high level SDK building on top of uh, Core Bluetooth on iOS and Android BLE APIs on Android uh, to provide you like. Um, uh, Capability to detect uh, Eddy Stone beacons, and uh, it's actually interesting. Like with the support for iBeacon and AltBeacon in the proximity API, I actually wonder if nearby API will end up with uh, support for iBeacon and AltBeacon as well as as Eddy Stone. But this remains to be seen because nearby API is not out yet. It's coming in um, in an update to Google Play Services 7.8, and we don't know the date uh, for the iOS yet. Um, but um, it's, 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 it's like the interesting part, it's not actually not only beacons. It's like the reason I called it a proximity SDK because uh, it's beacons and it's Bluetooth, but it's also like uh, a phone to phone, so like a device to device sort of proximity uh, proximity solution. And it can also use Wi Fi and an and audible sound. Uh, so basically, like a speaker and, and, and microphone sort of uh, acting as as, uh, as sensors. And like, um, I, I feel like the big disappointment in the community is like that. Uh, yeah, Google essentially announced this to be uh, to end up as a part of Google Play services, which, uh, as we know, is closed source. Something I, uh, I know Steve uh, emphasized a lot earlier uh, in, in this webinar. So um, so yeah, like this this actually raises a question: What about like on the, all the Android devices without Play services in the, right, like Amazon or like uh, in China? As Xiaomi, for example, um, like you don't need nearby API to detect Eddystone, right? You can like still utilize the native BLE API and uh, and um, and detect them yourself. It's just like you you like sort of like miss out on on, on like the power of, uh, of of Google here. And uh, although it like uh, <laughs> uh, remains to be remains to be seen um, uh, how how actually. Uh, like the adoption of, of proximity API and, and, and nearby API actually it's uh, sort of like remains remains to be seen so uh, so yeah like there is not much we can actually uh, talk about when it comes to like the capabilities of nearby API because it's not out yet the only thing we have is like this video from Google uh, 100 days of Google Dev uh, is like uh, I don't remember which part where they like showed a sneak peek of like some 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 snippets of code how you would use it on Android. The only thing we can see here is that uh, it actually works with Eddy Stone and integrates with the proximity API, right? We have those namespace type attachments, so yeah, something that was part of the uh, attachments resource uh, in the proximity API. Um, and when it comes to <laughs> iOS, like uh, there is like even even fewer clues. So uh, I, I wish we could tell more, but yeah, we just need to wait person patiently on um, until we actually get our hands on on those. Although I, I yeah, like like I mentioned earlier, I do actually find it interesting that Google embraced both Android and iOS. Um, not only like in Edistone, which was like meant to be an open uh, open format from the very beginning, but also in the uh, like closed source nearby API and their cloud service, so so the proximity API. Yeah, I think from a strategy perspective, um, you know, G Google and we've seen this a little bit with Microsoft buying up a, a lot of companies and now having sort of some flagship like real estate on like the iOS home screen. Google has some really popular apps, right? Um, you know, Maps, YouTube, Chrome, and these are used by a lot of people. And they clearly want to leverage the fact that those apps are, you know, very, very popular on iOS devices and, and make sure that, like, whatever they do is open um, for iOS. So it, it, there's some strategy, you know, I'm sure going on behind the scenes, but you could think also of products that. <clears throat> that Google is now uh, embracing, like for example, at the Google I/O conference, 
they went pretty in depth into their new photos app and it's um it's a really good um app and uh, you know runs obviously on ios and it will uh, take and catalog every photo you've ever taken and allow you to do things like face search and all kinds of all kinds of cloud-based image recognition is going on and i would argue that app is much more popular on ios than android why because iOS is just doing better than Android, um, particularly at the high end, particularly now with um, the emergence that it's had in China and other places. Uh, maybe not on an absolute um, scale, but um, are there, uh, you know, a lot of high-end iOS devices that are that, that really need to be seamlessly integrated with Google services, yes. So um, th th it will be fascinating to see how beacons evolve with um, being used on iOS, iOS uh, even though these are services that, um, that we you know, think uh, of ourselves as whether it's Gmail or YouTube as um, as just being, you know, 100% Google, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, actually, without further ado, we're, we're, we're uh, coming to an end shortly. Like the two, uh, in, in my opinion, most exciting pieces left, uh, the physical web. So the big promise, beacons working without an app, right? Like with with an, this, this opaque identifier uh, in German, uh, like, like um, in the form of UID major and minor, or like even namespace and, and ID, like the operating ins system itself doesn't doesn't really know how to handle that, right? Whereas like if we're broadcasting a URL, that's easy, right? We have the protocol in there, we have like the host name, we have the resource name, so we can just hit uh, hit the server and like uh, acquire a web page or like go to a web app, download a file. Maybe it's a deep link, uh, deep link to an native app. So um, so basically the operating operating system knows uh, how to handle it, right? So so like that's like the first sort of like technical limitation, which uh, w which is suddenly not there, right? And um, and, and, and actually um, promises to, 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 to fulfill this like beacons without an app, uh, without an app vision, right? There are of course still like some UX challenges, right? Uh, you don't want to be like spammed with notifications or anything like that. And like that, that was the huge advantage of like the, uh, you need an app model, right? You need to like opt in um, for beacons and 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 then it's all right and um, so yeah like today you still need an app uh, the, the physical web app but um, like I, I think this is this only like proves that Google has uh, has not given up on the physical web and quite quite the contrary they're actually moving forward and we can we can expect some exciting things here in the future I think so I'm mean, just to kind of you know again like kind of just really explain in non um, in simple terms how big of a deal this is. Google, effectively the second biggest companies in the, in the world in mobile, has now planned, standardized, adopted, announced <coughs> um, based, you know, support for Bluetooth beacons. So Bluetooth beacons are the winning technology, and you have the second biggest mobile company in the world that has said, this is going to be the future. It's going to be the future of all kinds of different initiatives, including this thing that we've been thinking of for, for a long time, which is the physical web, right, which is we like to say the physical world is 100 times bigger than this like online internet <laughs> that we used to surf with this small 640 by 480 browser. So now you're walking around with this amazing uh, high capability smartphone and wouldn't it be great if it understood and helped predict what you're doing in the physical world. So Google is embracing this. This is absolutely massive for, for the industry and um, uh, the fact that we don't know how it's all going to play out is, is great. Um, we, we don't, um, but it's uh, it's clearly ex exception, you know, it's, it's going to be extremely exciting, exciting um, to see what happens over the next 12 months. Yes, yes, definitely. And uh, the physical web is just one thing, but um, but yeah, like this announcement I quoted, like like this quote from the announcement I um, I shown later uh, earlier, um, we will be integrating vehicles into in, into our uh, Google services, into like other Google services as well. I, I think for me personally, this is like the most the most exciting part. Like Edison is, is great; it's a multi-platform, open, well-designed protocol, right? Uh, we have like the proximity API with like. Uh, it's like basically yeah, uh, Google embracing the challenges, uh, the challenges with beacon deployments from day one. Um, but yeah, like uh, we can actually expect um, some dev f further developments with the physical web and other Google services, right? So right off the bat, they announced that Google now um, will will gain some some beacon integration. They they, they were speaking a lot about like uh, proximity and context uh, uh, during this year's uh, Google I/O. Uh, so this, this seems like a natural, uh, natural next step. But uh, yeah, then then I also gave this example of uh, beacon-based transit notifications for Google Maps, which is already up and uh, running in Portland. Uh, so I, I guess we can expect some more uh, beacon things with Google and like beacon integrations with Google Maps as well, and 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 then the physical web. And I I don't even know what uh, what could be next, but I'm pretty sure we can expect more. So so yeah, 
I, I feel those are like really exciting times for like the beacon the beacon scene um, and uh, and yeah ahead of us. No, no question. Yeah, I think um, well that's great. I, um, we're we're clearly like really excited that um, you know Google has has decided to just totally embrace this technology. We've been we've been working on this for many years and and have um, really just like embraced the the innovation that developers from a bottoms up perspective uh, you know. Do when they when they come up with an idea for this you know new experience or new contextualized application. So, like I think the momentum is um is just really gonna uh it's it's gonna take the world by surprise. And there's a lot of stuff um that is gonna be announced from Estimo and, and in general from some of the large enterprises that are gonna be deploying the you know at scale implementations based on iBeacon. And so now now there's gonna be this question of okay great what is what does Eddie Stone now also do and um, for for large companies that want to be Android and iOS, they may um, you know, may decide to, to broadcast even like both packets, right, in a beacon. And so we have much more to come uh, around that. I guess um, we'll stop there, but we, we have some questions, and so I'll go into the first one. We have a question. I'll let you answer this, Peter. Um, can a beacon transmit all types of frames in the same configuration? Uh, so could it could it transmit these different types of frames? And also, does the Eddie Stone URL? It's a second question. Get get um, does it get people that does it give people the option to receive uh, like URL based messages? Uh, sure. Yeah. Great questions. Actually. Uh, so so yeah. The first one can can the beacon transmit all types of frames in the same configuration? So yeah. Um, like we like we mentioned earlier, like Eddie Stone just tells you, uh, like basically specifies a bunch of frames uh, which a beacon can broadcast uh, to make it like uh, Eddie Stone compatible or like broadcast Eddie Stone packets, and 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 then we also have iBeacon, and there's like technically nothing actually preventing uh, like the same hardware from um, broadcasting multiple packets, right? So so mm -hmm. um, th this might as well be just like the future of beacon hardware, right? Beacons which can broadcast uh, broadcast multiple packets. I don't believe we have this yet. Uh, like no, none of the beacons in the market right now can actually broadcast multiple uh, kinds of packets at the same time. But uh, but yeah, like technically there's, there's no limitation uh, that wouldn't allow uh, um, the hardware to do so other from like the battery uh, life challenges and all those things, right? We essentially end up broadcasting twice or thrice uh, more the data. So uh, it obviously impacts the battery life. So so yeah, we'll need to see some more innovation in, in this field still. still. But um, yeah, I, I can definitely foresee this like a future of, uh, of the beacon hardware. 100%. And you made the comment earlier that we were ex just really proud as a company to, to have supported um, every beacon we have ever created because we could be flashed, right? Could have an over the air firmware update to support the Eddystone protocol. And, and that literally means a beacon that if the pattern was still alive that we shipped two years ago could, could work today with this protocol. So the way that we think about optimized hardware software and just really converged hardware software, but this smart firmware on a non-commodity device, right, that, that is like extensible and is, 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 is future-proof, well, it could incorporate elements of both um, these protocols. Uh, it, can it? Absolutely. And does Estimate does also do things with packets that are creative to uh, to, to do stuff like indoor location? Yes, we do. So the, I think the future of what a beacon can be will potentially be multi-platform and platform agnostic, but tied to optimized hardware. And um, we're really excited about the, um, the deployments of customers are be announcing soon based on um, just you know, us and, and even others um, to, to prove that the, at scale, this stuff really works, um, right? So that's awesome. Um, I have another question for you around security, Peter. Um, we had one come in that does, does Eddie Stone take care of any security? And they specifically reference like, for example, a rotated or a rotating um, identifier or would you know the app developer still, if they wanted to use uh, have security, would they still have to use an est uh, you know estimates sort of offering or SDK in order to to have a rotated UUID? Did did Eddie Stone specify anything around security? Yeah, I, I love this question. That's a great question. So uh, actually, there is something in the specification called an uh, ephemeral ID. Uh, so the concept is actually very similar, if not like uh, we don't know the details yet. This is something Google only mentioned in. Uh, it's, it's not actually in the specification. It's in the um, uh, blog post announcement. So we don't like uh, know the the details or like what Google had in mind uh, when they mentioned that. But yeah, I can essentially. Uh, imagine this to be something very similar to uh, to estimate security UID. So basically, like an, an identifier which changes over time and which like only like the rightful like like the authorized uh, app 
uh, or, or, or 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 an authorized our authorized device can sort of like decrypt and 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 uh, actually get to know like the real uh, identifier of the of the beacon. So so yeah, like that's another great example of like Google doing some 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 like putting a lot of thought basically into this the design of Edistone and tackling not only like the fleet management um, challenges but also like the security challenges, which again like many people. Uh, when they like start with uh, playing with beacons, don't even realize until they like are ready for um, for like a mass scale uh, rollout. Definitely, I guess like just to kind of um, talk about what that so security is something that a lot of people that have secure indoor physical environments, retail being kind of the the main the main one here because they're they're very like you know very much don't want their store to have intruders if you will. Um, so the security that we've architected rotates identifiers to completely mask them so you just like can't even sniff them. So in the example of a malicious app or even you know just the, the, the case that retailers bring up a lot is what if Walmart put beacons up and then they got the beacons to work with Walmart app but Amazon uh, intercepted some of the signals and you know use that to somehow wake up the Amazon app and send you a deal and you know buy diapers from us instead of at Walmart and um, that wouldn't be great right and so security is something we've architected shipped launched have people using it scale and it works and it's also patented so the fact that uh, Google came up with some scheme of security awesome but it's not shipped yet like there's no specification on it. So I think again, when an app developer has to think about what decision they're gonna make around protocols and services, of course they, you know, they really need to be kind of perceptive that some of these are checkbox items, but if you actually wanna build something today um, at scale, then you, you, know, you probably have to use what's available today. So security, um, we just don't know exactly how the entire market is gonna think about beacon security in the future. Um, the, uh, it's awesome that Google agrees that there's probably a problem with um, beacons being sniffed and open. Awesome. And then does Estimo have this today? And you know, can you use it from us? Yes, check the checkbox. So that's that's um, that's great. Uh, there's another question that I'll answer. And um, Anthony's just asking. I have Estimo beacons. There's an update. Is there any update that needs to happen to work with Eddystone? Yeah. So when uh, when we talk about every beacon being shipped capable of working with Eddystone today, that's that's true. The 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 um, only thing you need to do is update the firmware on the beacon, and the way to do that is to go into the you know Google Play services. Most people thinking about Eddystone are probably Android developers, so download the Estimote app from the Google Play Store, and when you download the the Estimote app, you'll be able to connect to your beacons and then actually update the firmware. It'll take you a couple minutes, and that capability is coming to iOS um, in the next version of the uh, of the app that we submit to Apple. So, in the next week or two. Um, so that's I, that question. Yes. Yeah, I actually wanted to come back to one of the earlier questions. Uh, I think it was a great one. How does the Eddystone URL get people to opt in to receive URL messages? Uh, things like fairly important and probably something uh, that that lots of people have uh, um, have been asking and have on their mind. So, like Eddystone URL in and of itself is just like a um, just a specification, right? Here is what you do to broadcast something which we call an Eddystone URL, which contains a URL in it, and now. It's, if, if, if you like recall this, like uh, one of the very first diagrams, of, like the hardware on the left and the protocol in the middle and software on the right, this is this is what actually, actually what ends up in software, right? Like this very right part. And um, so so we're actually like yet to see like today, um, you, you you need the physical web app uh, from Google. You can download it from the App Store, or Google Play Store. Uh, and this is how you actually discover, like you, you physically open the app and then it shows you like which URLs are being broadcasting nearby. Uh, but we're actually like, this is this sort of like user experience challenge that, that we're sort of like yet to see how Google will solve this one. Like it will be a little tricky on iOS, I guess, because like um, they can only operate like within a uh, very like confined environment. Whereas on Android, Google can probably actually do everything they uh, they want, but, but doesn't necessarily mean that they should like allow um, notifications or something like that, because like yeah, that 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 would be just uh, bad user experience. So 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 uh, so the answer to the question is like we're actually yet to see how Google will solve this. This is actually a major challenge if you think about it. Definitely, and, it, and like the, the fact that there's two main platforms that exist today. Um, you know, effectively, Windows Phone is now dead. So it's not that there's a fragmented list of, of you know five different um, major platforms that are that are different, including Symbian. It's just two today, right? That are really relevant, um, but but they're they're quite different. And how to unify the experience on these, or how 
you know, if you're the person deploying beacons to get this stuff to work with both iOS and Android, which would generally always be the goal, it, it, there's going to be questions um, on how to make, you know, make sure that, that that actually works. And around the physical web, there's a question here that Matthew just asked, like, if, this is nice, it's like the physical web is interesting, dot, dot. How will Google push browser support with Safari, IE, and Firefox? And then it says more of a rhetorical question. So so that's that's a funny question, right? And it, like the, the question of, of browser support for Safari, well, you know, Apple, uh, unless they, um, you know, adopted um, inside their browser the ability to do this natively and said, yeah, we like this, this Eddystone thing, um, then it wouldn't work, right? But maybe they'll do something open around iBeacon in the browser. Um, I, I think we just don't know, but it's very clear that both those companies are thinking about like predictive computing and what you do on your phone um, uh, and, and how you kind of navigate through, through the physical world. Is it being contextualized at a higher level, i.e. lock screen and, and other places? And so um, we, we, we'll, we'll see how that plays out. Of course, there's fragmentation in this market. And if you have an iOS phone, it doesn't work neatly with everything that the Android and vice versa. Um, but at scale, there's there's enough um, there's enough penetration with each that there's going to be some unique experiences built, and and you know we're a fan of of cross platform, multi platform stuff because it, it drives the industry uh, forward. Yeah, sure. So uh, just to breeze through some of the other questions here, uh, is Ediston Bluetooth uh, uh, greater than 4.0 compatible in cross-platform? So yeah, Ediston is a Bluetooth uh, 4.0 protocol. So yeah, it, it actually requires um, a Bluetooth uh, 4.0 uh, capable device. Um, when it comes to the cross-platform, like the, the official design goal is to make it iOS and Android compatible, but it's an open protocol, right? And and, and and it's a BLE protocol, and there's like many other platforms out there which actually support BLE. So like as long as as, as, um, as the device or as the platform uh, actually supports like discovering uh, Bluetooth 4.0 devices, um, then yeah, the, we, we should be seeing like um, we should be seeing SDKs to 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 do to scan for and, and detect estimo Edistone um, beacons uh, like in no time. Um, and then we have: Will your library have support for Xamarin uh, Android? Uh, so yeah, like we've uh, we've actually worked with the Xamarin folks in the past on uh, bringing uh, support for stickers and like the Estimo SDK uh, onto their platform. So we'll see if we can actually do uh, something similar here. And um, do you think the, the goal would be definitely yes, and we love the folks at Xamarin. They're um, they're awesome to work with, and uh, we've been embracing that community and are super excited about uh, you know these .NET developers that want to um, that, that want to just you know to, to build apps um, in that native language that they're familiar with around Android. So I, I would guess that the answer to that would be um, yes. We'll have to we'll have to um, to see how the, you know this stuff goes post launch. Yeah, that's great. So uh, another question here: uh, Do you have an example which demonstrates hooking up Estimo to Beacon with Google APIs? Uh, we don't have yet. Keep an eye on our uh, developer portal slash Eddystone. We'll certainly be expanding it with time. Uh, for now, if you're interested into uh, like uh, an example of how to integrate with Google APIs, uh, GitHub.com slash Google slash Beacon dash platform, I believe, uh, is uh, is actually uh, uh, examples provided by Google. Um, which uh, both for iOS and Android uh, on how to hook up um, um, Eddystone, uh, Eddystone beacons with, uh, with the proximity API. So, uh, and one more question here. Uh, can Edison allow us to come up with one universal SDK so that we don't all have to ask app publisher partners uh, to install our SDK? So, uh, like again, Ediston in and of itself is just a protocol, right? So, no, it doesn't allow something like that. But like, uh, we're actually like yet to see what like the how how the ecosystem around uh, Ediston evolves, right? And what uh, Google will actually be built in into the uh, Google Play services and how the nearby API will work. So there's certainly like a lot of open questions still, and like I can't wait to uh, to get my hands on the nearby API and 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 see what Google. Uh, what Google actually uh, actually allows here, so uh, yeah, like definitely stay tuned and uh, stay tuned for that. Yeah, awesome. Well, th um, I think we're gonna wrap up, Peter. We've been on the phone for uh, a little bit over an hour, and um, um, you know, I think we expected even to go shorter. So uh, it was nice to just really go through everything in depth. Hopefully, and this video recording or um, the webinar recording will be available on YouTube afterward. And uh, you know, please don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have any questions about um, you know this and us and how we fit in and what we think about 
um, the, the space uh, now that, that Google has basically said, yeah, that this Bluetooth beacon thing is real. Um, we're, we're obviously like thrilled about that and have been really impressed with the amount of inquiries we've already seen. But we're available on Twitter at Estimote as well as contact at Estimote.com. And, um, and thanks for joining us today. We really uh, are excited about what's next in this market. Thank you and um, stay tuned for more.